Hello, my name's Gary Tooson. I'm the County Archivist at the Norfolk Record Office. A number of years ago, I was interviewing somebody for a job nothing to do with the Record Office, but they were a researcher, and we got onto the subject of archive catalogues. And one of the things they said to me was, well, as far as they're concerned, all archive catalogues are useless as they don't do what they need them to do. Now, to a certain degree, I agree with her. Um, when you think about it, archive catalogues represent enormous collections and they're the main gateway to them. So, for example, in Norfolk, we don't know how many documents we've got. You know, people have banned about various multiples of millions to describe it. So, for the sake of argument, let's say we had 10 million documents. Our catalogue contains 900,000 records. Clearly, you know, that's stretching it even to have one description per record. But I think this um, hides the picture. Archivists often talk about percentages of cat a collection which have been catalogued, but really quite often this misses the point. Um, the way archivists catalogue hierarchically is done for very, very good reasons. The idea of using ISAD, G, and getting intellectual control of a collection by describing collections and then working down for a hierarchy is a really good way of getting that control over the collection, but also a way of um, managing your resources so that you can direct scarce resources to where it's going to be most effective. But the problem is the user, the researcher, really wants much more detailed information. Now, back when I was first working in archives, was well, I used to sit in an office, and the archivist used to scribble away, writing up catalogues, it would go to a typist, the typist would type up the catalogues, and then, before everything was finished, it would go to a third member of staff, who would sit there at another typewriter typing up index cards, quite inaccurately on occasions, but, you know, it meant that we were creating access points into that collection. Now, when archives moved across to um, online catalogues, we introduced new database systems. In lots of ways, we gave up on that um, indexing work, and we relied much, much more on free text searching, which is great, you know, really, really useful. But we're reaching the point now where well, our, our catalogue's getting very large. You know, we're almost into the realm of big data when we're talking about and what we've got there. Um, and free text searching doesn't necessarily do all we need it to do. So in lots of ways, we do need to be thinking more about structure and data. And going back almost, probably being a difference in process, but to that idea of the reference points and the indexing with entities and concepts being available as access points as well. Now, if you think about what I was just saying about the inadequacy of the number of descriptions we have in catalogues and the extra work, which this indexing and creation of access points is going to create if we're going to lead to the, the utopian perfect world, um, clearly that's impossible. It's just not going to happen. Yes, we can do more and more things now using IT. We use natural language processing to, you know, entity recognition, and we can do um, text recognition, and we can, you know, we can do lots that way. But it's never going to replace the need for human interaction to create that metadata within the catalogues. Now, because we don't have that resource, um, and it is nigh on impossible to do the whole collections, I think it's something which we really need to address as a way of collaborative working. We need to be imaginative about how we go about it, how we achieve that rich data which all users will benefit from. I mean, a, a thought experiment which I've... <laughs> <laughs> I've had a couple of times is well you know if you think about our researchers in the search room over the last 20 years if the work they had done 10% of that information could be fed back into the catalogues as metadata how rich would our catalogues be how much information would be in there so rather than this research being done again and again in some cases you know future researchers benefiting from that 
It'll be great. So we need to approach this in lots of different ways. And it's something which we're looking at in the Norfolk Record Office. You know, there are a number of things we're doing. You know, a classic old one, which has been around for a long time, is using volunteers to help catalogue. Um, and we've got numerous volunteer projects. Um, we've got um, one which has been quite successful is where we've been working with volunteers. And they've been catalogue our building regulation plans. You know, the catalogue says, Box of Building Regulation Plans 1954. One of ten. So the chances of anybody going through those they'd have to have a fairly deg high degree of probability that there would be something which they're really interested in there. If they're catalogued right down to the item level, the individual plan level, you know, the chances of people stumbling across as well as being able to go directly to what they require is much, much higher. Um, and that project's been, you know, success. It's a great engagement for volunteers, you know, engaging with volunteers has got well-being benefits as well as benefits to the organisation. So it's a, a symbiosis there. Um, and those sort of volunteer projects are great. You know, you always have to balance the amount of staff input against the output from the volunteers and things like that. But that works fine. But we need to do more than just you know, traditional volunteer pro projects. So a few other things we've been doing. Um, We've been working with the University of East Anglia. We now run a uh, early modern history MA module, which is looking at the records of church courts. So another good example of how catalogues can be inadequate is how um, you know we've got a superb series of deposition books. You know, so, but again, the deposition books say things like. Um, you know, a consistory court of the Bishop of Norwich um, deposition book, 1666 to 1680. And that's it, you know. Um, how much better if the catalogue actually tells you what all those depositions are, what cases they relate to, categorise them as type of cause. And we don't have the resources to do this. I mean, we have got slightly more now because it was great paleography practice for our archivists when um, we first entered lockdown. So it was something we had, we had some digital copies of the records so they could you know, do some of that work whilst working from home. Um, but we've been working with students at UEA so that they can then interact with those records and they can produce some of that data for us. So we have a session from them. Um, we teach them the basics and how to use the um, forms we've set up and talk about the nature of the records and then they spend a chunk of their time on the course generating metadata for us which we can then import into our catalogues um, again you know a slow way of generating data but very targeted and a very important set of records another thing i'm doing is i'm uh, i'm co-supervising a collaborative phd now the reason I got involved is I wanted to see if we could use collaborative PhDs as a way of generating this data for our catalogues. So um, the one which I'm supervising is about literary activity in Norfolk in the early 19th century and the candidate on it is collecting her notes in a format which I can then easily import into our catalogues. So when she's going through correspondence and creating abstracts, she's also creating some index access points as she does that. Um, it's not generating a huge amount of data, and I, you know, I never really expected this project to, but I'm using it as a pilot to see if this is feasible. And I, I bu I'm booking in a session with Hannah, who's doing it soon, and we're going to look at how we might improve that process because it's something which... Um, you know, could be a very great way of getting information into our catalogues, which is being created by somebody who's got special skills. As one of the questions I've often asked is, if you're relying on non-staff to generate this data, how do you cope with quality issues? You know, it's an important question. You know, there has to be a certain reliance which can be put on the data. And there are ways you can do that, you know, with volunteer projects, you know, we're just use, using tools where we perhaps get two things done and then we compare and that identifies if there's a problem there and then we can, you know, pay more attention to it. And if, if they're both the same, two people have done it, you know, it, it passes and it, and it goes through. Um, but that's not always a great way of doing it. And you can, you, can, you can develop the skills. And in some ways, you can worry too much about it. Um, one of the... I was having lunch one day with... Um, an archivist, well, it's me, an archivist, 
a an historian and an archaeologist. That sounded a bit like a joke, but um, you know, we were talking about this issue, and the historian was telling me about you know what concerns about the accuracy of data, how they rely on it. Um, but the archaeologist pointed out, well, you know, in Norfolk we've got this set of um, this multi-volume history of the county called Bloom, written by Bloomfield uh, a couple hundred years ago. It's got lots of inaccuracies in it, you know, lots of very, very good information, but she was pointing out, you know, you wouldn't be without it, would you? So having that data, even though on occasions it might not be 100% accurate, is better than not having any data. And one of the important ways of getting in this, you know, which is important for any research, is being aware of how data is gathered. So I tend to use the term paradata to talk about it, you know. One of the things which is important to record is how that, that data is generated. So that you can see or make an error, make a qualitative judgment about how important, how the veracity of that data and how much reliance and how much checking it needs. Um, but the final thing, which I haven't done yet, which I just wanted to mention, which I think is really important for collaboration in the future, are digital humanities projects. Um, digital humanities projects are great. You know, we've seen some superb websites created. You know, principal investigators are getting superb results and really getting um, a collaborative effort in the first place with all this data. But one of the things which I haven't been able to do yet, which I'm really keen on doing, is that feedback me mechanism where the process of generating that data doesn't just lead to a website which meets the project objectives, but also feeds back data which can be reused within the archive catalogues themselves. You know, this has got the opportun opportunity here for generating a very large amount of data which can be reused by people with very, very different research objectives who may not actually even consider using the website which may be the creation of that project. Also information which is being generated by specialists in the field, so back to that um, trust issue on the accuracy of the data, you know, that's going to be strong. And something which is really, really sustainable. Yeah. There are one of the things which um, archivists talk about a lot is digital preservation. Um, you know, it's born digital we talk about a lot in that the, the, the information which never sees paper is generated on, you know, IT nowadays. But that issue also stretches to the metadata we're talking about, which is containing catalogues and various websites. And one of the, if we've got hundreds of websites with lots and lots of different structures, you know, preservation of that in the long term, we're talking decades, centuries here. You know, we're still using metadata, which was generated by Victorian gentlemen cataloguing city records 150 years ago. So containing it within those standards-based archive catalogues is also a way of giving that longevity to that data so it can be used again and again and again for generations. So in short really I think um, there are lots of opportunities out there for collaboration where yes working with an archive results in better outcomes for the project itself but also we want to get those feeding the other way as well so there's that longevity and that enrichment of quantity and quality of the catalogue data which is available and i think you know there's great opportunities out there